All right, hello and welcome everyone to the American Theatre Wing's network panel titled, A New Development, Theatre Fundraising Through Virtual Doors. For those of you who are returning, who have attended previous panels of ours, welcome back. We're so, so happy to have you here again. Um, and to our new members who, maybe this is your first uh, webinar that you're attending, welcome. Uh, thanks so much for joining us and we can't wait to, to hear from you and just get to know you better. Um, so before we jump into this panel, uh, which we're very, very excited for, um, we want to take a moment to just introduce ourselves and give a, a brief overview on what the network is. So my name is Melissa Cabrero and I am a Programs Associate here at The Wing. And I am Alicia Vaninchak. I am also a Programs Associate at The Wing. And just to give a, a brief overview, uh, the network is one of The Wing's many educational and professional development programs which fosters a supportive, creative community. Uh, through the network, Aspiring theater administrators, students, interns, and young professionals can connect with panels of seasoned professionals, like our panel here today, uh, theater companies, and other major players in the New York uh, theater scene and beyond. Um, members learn from the different administrative and behind the scenes careers from the folks that are doing them. So uh, being a member of the network is to be linked to like-minded individuals uh, with access to exclusive panels, events, and seminars, all designed to help you advance your career. So tonight we will hear from these panelists that you see who have done and continue to do incredible work in the development world. Um, as Melissa and I can both attest to as part of the programs department at the wing, the work that we do would be impossible without the vital and fundamental work of fundraising and development to support our educational programming and our organization as a whole. Um, development staff are often the unsung heroes and we're so excited to highlight your hard work and dedication to your organizations and the theater industry as a whole. Um, so we are now going to just going to take a moment to briefly introduce uh, our panelists to maximize the amount of time we have uh, to have a conversation. Um, and I just want to highlight that these panelists are actually joining us from all across the country uh, for the first time ever. So these are, this is our first national panelist uh, team, which is super exciting. We're really thrilled about that. Um, so First off, joining us this evening, we have Leslie Bradbury, and if you just want to give a little wave as I introduce you, uh, she is the Director of Development from Stephen Wolf Theatre Company in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, Leslie has over 30 years of development experience and has been with Stephen Wolf for the past three years. She and her team are fresh off their virtual gala called Pants Optional, a Stephen Wolf soiree, which happened on May 9th, so pretty recently. <laughs> Great. Um, also joining us is Daria Hepps, um, who's worked as a fundraising professional for more than 20 years. Uh, she's currently in her 11th season at Berkeley Rep Theater in Berkeley, California, uh, where she works as the Associate Director of Development, uh, overseeing institutional, corporate, and planned giving, and also helps implement the theater's major individual giving strategy, including work on its annual gala. Um, so yeah, and then our third panelist is Caitlin Quinn, if you want to give a quick wave, um, who's joining us from American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco, California. Uh, she's currently their Director of Development, um, and Caitlin's career in arts fundraising has spanned nearly 20 years as she has worked at organizations including uh, Segerstrom Center for the Arts, Goodspeed Musicals, and Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. And rounding out tonight's panel is Greg Reiner, who brings a slightly different perspective to the panel as the Director of Theater and Musical Theater at the National Endowment for the Arts in Washington, D.C., uh, where he manages the NEA's grant making uh, in theater and musical theater and represents the agency to the field as a whole across the country, which is super exciting. And then prior to taking on his role in 2015, uh, Greg held positions as the executive executive director of Classic Stage Company and was the founding executive director of Tectonic Theater Project in New York City. Um, so a big thank you for being here tonight, panelists. We really appreciate you spending your evening and sharing some time with us 
So uh, with that said, it is now my pleasure to turn the conversation over to our moderator, Heather. Thank you so much and thank you for that incredible introduction. I am very blessed, as you can see, to have an extraordinary staff. Um, one of the things that we care about a lot at the wing is uh, the next generation. And you know, highlighting for the next generation the varied careers that they can have in the theater and in the performing arts. And you know, I think none of us necessarily knew, although we'll get into this in a minute, whether we'd end up in development um, or in, in, in philanthropy, in your case, Greg. Um, and you know, I was a drummer, and that's what my degree is in. And I got coughed up out of conservatory. Nobody told me about what any of the careers in the theater were and you know I was working at a sort of a, a radio station a local radio station in Doylestown Pennsylvania and there was a woman who did a culture show there and she said um hey kid you know you should go apply to the American Music Theater Festival in, in Philadelphia and, and do an internship I walked in the door applying for a marketing internship and the producing director at the time said no you're not a marketing person you're a development person scared the bejesus out of me because the thought of raising money, and I think this is a big myth, scares people. Um, and, you know, it's like, oh, I don't want to do that. But it is actually, for me, and, and I'm not, I, I, you know, I'm not the development titled person anymore, but as any CEO worth their salt knows that you're always a development person um, and you have to support your development people um, across the board. So it's, you know, it's been an incredible journey and I sort of feel like there's a lot of myths around it, you know, and I like to say, look, development is really about passion, telling your story and following up. And, you know, and the guilt that goes with it, because a lot of people have guilt, I'm like, they're going to give their money to someone, why not you? So that's my story of development. I'd love to hear um, from you, Leslie, did development choose you or did you choose development? Oh my God, it totally chose me. I s literally stumbled into it. I um, came from an opera family. My dad ran the local opera company in Augusta, Georgia. And um, I was following in his footsteps and kind of wanted to go into arts management. And at the time there was no arts management degree. Um, <laughs> But I knew uh, very clearly that I wanted to go and work for Lyric Opera of Chicago because of the woman who was running the organization. Um, so I uh, drove up to Chicago, I think it was my um, junior year of college, got an internship and it was a summer internship. And so the only jobs available um, during the summertime at the Opera House was, it was a job in development. Um, so I stumbled in, I got involved with their telefund and started calling people and um, just kind of got, got into it that way. And then right after um, I graduated from college, I um, got in my car, drove back up to Chicago, practically parked in front of the opera house, went upstairs and said, what do you have? I'll take it. And <laughs> it was a job in the telephone. And so I was calling for subscriptions and calling for um, money. And really, I just sort of tumbled in, stumbled in, and just sort of worked my way up the ranks there um, at that opera company. But what I didn't know was how sophisticated the actual Devo shop was there. And I really just lucked into learning it on the job with some of the best people in the country doing it. So fell in love with it. But there was a passion behind um, the product, like a genuine passion behind the product, which I, I personally think makes it so much easier to raise money. So that's how I got into got into development. Amazing. Caitlin, what's, what's your story? <laughs> yeah, mine is a, a you know, there, this, there was, this was not a linear path by any stretch. I actually started out life uh, planning to be an academic. I wanted, I was teaching at the university level, um, you know, mostly as, obviously as an adjunct, but there were no jobs. And um, there were actually jobs doing development work and they paid better than teaching jobs. Um, and a friend of mine who was at Lincoln Center told me about a job there and I went and interviewed and they hired me, which I thought was the biggest mistake that anybody could make. And they hired me, I was, it was an assistant director position and I think they just really wanted somebody who was a strong writer and a strong communicator. Right. And um, I spent the entire first year there 
waiting every single day, figuring they were going to today's the day they're going to fire me because they realize like they've made a terrible mistake and I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, but it was really like a baptism by fire. I mean, Lincoln Center is a fundraising machine. I worked there when Reynold Levy was the president and he is- Talk like, about a fundraiser, right? Oh my gosh, yeah, I learned so much from that man. It was just, he, it, was, it was a crash, every day was a crash course. So um, yeah, and then that was it. Then I was just on the path, um, you know, they gave me more and more responsibility. They ended up giving me some fundraising events to run. I, I really started primarily doing corporate fundraising. Um, yeah, and just sort of, you know, just it was one of those things that happened. And then every job I went to after that, I just, I feel like I acquired more skills. Oh, I got the major gifts portion of it here. I got the plan giving part of it here. So I, I think of myself as just sort of like the, the, the perennial jack of all trades. Excellent. Daria. Um, I guess you would say that I, I owe the start of my career to nepotism. Um, I was working... <laughs> I was, I was trying to put together a career as an actor, but I was working in a development adjacent position at a science museum in the Bay Area. And a, a position opened up at a local ballet company and my cousin was on the board. And she told me about the position. She knew I had an arts background, of course, and um, I thought that I would have some, some affinity and, and some of the skills that were necessary. So uh, she made the introduction and like Caitlin, I, I thought they were crazy to hire me and it was definitely a baptism by fire. And then over, over the course of my career, I've just been working closer and closer to my true love, which is theater. And now I work for Berkeley Rep. And I, I just feel that theater has such power to create community and inspire empathy and, um, and uh, grow knowledge. And it's such a pleasure to me to have the opportunity to uh, amplify some of the, some of the, the best voices uh, that are working in that field. I think it's really important, a couple of things that you said, um, a, a number of you, all of us, our paths are not linear. I think, you know, um, when I do a lot of talking with young people and they, they want to say, give me the three steps I need to do. What are the three steps I need to do? And it's like, you just need to keep moving forward. Life is not linear and it's in the zigs and zags that you discover your, your contributions, your true self. And I think it's, it's important to hear that to just have the confidence to sort of move through that. And speaking of zigs and zags, Greg, did you ever think you were going to end up in, in government <laughs> and rolling <laughs> out money? <laughs> Oddly enough, I remember the other day that uh, in my yearbook, in my, high, in my senior year, I was voted most likely to become a politician. So in some <laughs> weird way, that prophecy has come true. Close. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as you say, I, I've never had a held a type job with the title of development in it, but having been an executive director of three organizations I have been doing development my entire career and particularly at the earlier part of the of that career yeah, you know, small organizations you know there really wasn't a development director there wasn't a grant writer so I was right. I was writing the NEA grants um, and, and the zigzag into this was sort of having spent all that time doing that when this opportunity came open thinking two things one you know oh I have the opportunity to actually be the person I've always wanted to have in that job <laughs> And serve and be of, of service to all of my former co now you know colleagues. Um, and right. the, the second thing was you know when I was at Tectonic Theater Project, and we did this. And some of you may remember this when we did the Laramie Project ten years later, and we were trying to sort of model it after the Federal Theater Project. And we had this reading of the play in on the same night in 150 theaters all over the country. And part of the goal was to get all 50 states and territories in D.C. involved. And that process of actually calling and fi finding theaters in South Dakota and Wyoming and, and in, in our, you know, finding theaters in all these communities and speaking with, and, and feeling the power of this collective field was so inspiring. The idea, the opportunity to get back involved with the theater nationally and harness that collective power, which, you know, maybe we'll talk about later in terms of like, yeah. where are we now? Where do we go forward? Was really thrilling to me. And so that's sort of what led me to where I am. Well, thank you so much for sharing all that because I think it's so important for people to know the linear path and also to know that development is really, you know, storytelling and in the theater, we have such a story to tell. And when you look at the power 
of theater, you know, not just to entertain, we know that it does what that, but um, to move the needle in terms of social justice. Um, when you think of some of the work that, you know, existed when you think of Angels in America and what was happening then and now, um, you, you've seen theater move the needle. Um, and we all know what theater does for the economics of communities, you know, across the country. And I've always said that, you know, the arts um, is like the one sector that can say we do it all. We, you know, education gets improved, security and safety gets improved in a community, the economics go back and we inspire and, and, and document our history and move the needle politically. Like the arts is the easiest investment in the world, Greg. You're wanting to respond. I'm just gonna butt in because you said something that's so on my mind right now, Heather. Uh, I was just having this conversation yesterday with someone about how does the theater get back? And I think it really is about proving our value as more than just entertainment value. Yes. Especially when you're talking about fundraising. And you know, he asked me for a specific example, and I think we've talked about this before, but you know, when I, when we were at Tectonic and you know the, the Matthew Shepard James Bird Hate Crimes Act finally got signed into law in 2009. And Moises Kaufman, who's the director of that, the artistic director of that company, went with Judy Shepard, who's the mother of Matthew Shepard, to the White House for the bill signing. And on the way out, she said, Moises said, you must be so thrilled this is happening. She said, yeah, I'm glad this law is finally passed. But, you know, actually the Laramie Project, as a piece of theater, actually did more to stop anti-gay violence than a law is ever going to do. Right. I, we really need to own our power more now than ever before, which brings us to the topic of obviously we, we know we're living in, in, in very different and very difficult times. And, you know, just curious from each of your perspectives of is how are you seeing the pandemic? Obviously, the, we're not gathering, but changing fundraising in the wake of the pandemic. What changes do you see now and what changes do you foresee? Um, and let's start with Daria this time, if you if you don't mind. Um, I, I think that one of the biggest changes is going to be in the way we use special event funding, um, uh, fundraising. We are, we only have one fundraising event per year, but we have over 60 um, stewardship and cultivation events that may have, you know, anywhere from 20 to 150 people. And we're, we're just not going to be able to fundraise in that manner at this point. So I, I think it's a big opportunity for innovation. Um, maybe we'll be doing more intimate events. Maybe we'll do more online events like the one that we're doing right now. Um, maybe there will be events that take place outside. Maybe there will also be, I mean, definitely there will be um, more one-on-one -on -one interaction. And I think for that as well, we're going to really need a great core of volunteers um, to, to help us with this increase in one-on-one -on -one interaction. Absolutely, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think as much as there are challenges, there are opportunities. I mean, one of the things that I've spent time doing with our development staff is we've done Zoom calls with all of our major donors. Um, it's very different, um, you know, it was very inspiring because I was like, here's the state of the organization, this is what we're doing, and you know, one of the, the optimist in me feels really good because the, you know, in these calls, I said, you say no more, you've got my support. Um, there's an incredible um, amount of generosity out there and that understands what we contribute. So it's, it's, you know, and I thought, would I have done those video chats? Like there was something that was distant about it, obviously, but that was more intimate than a lunch in a way. And I'm, I can't really put my finger on what made this more, you know, more intimate, but it, it was, and we raised a lot of money very quickly in doing that. Um, Leslie, you're, you're fresh off of uh, the pants. <laughs> oh, <God>. <laughs> <laughs> what about just in case? <laughs> well, that, um, similarly, we really only do a major fundraiser um, each year, and it's our in-person gala, which attracts about 600 people. And um, a lot of cultural institutions in town have galas around this time of the year. And as we were looking at our colleagues, um, we saw a lot of cancellations or, or postponements of the in-person gala, but we saw what our friends at Berkeley Rep were doing. They were doing a virtual gala and they, we were like, if they can do it, let's just try it. What do we have to lose? Um, and so we, 
quickly, not we, my event, amazing events folks, um, put this together um, in a matter of weeks. And um, we made it free to anybody to attend, which was really, really cool. Um, and what, that, what happened is we ended up attracting, I think that evening, like over 5,000 people viewed it on YouTube and Facebook. Wow. Live. And then since then, we've had 14,000 views of this event. Um, which we made, um, it lasted, it was only about 90 minutes. And um, we set a goal to raise, um, I think we set the goal to raise uh, a little over $200,000. We, we haven't met our goal, we're almost there. Um, but the really fun thing is that um, we had teenagers texting in $10. We had parents of admin staff involved. We had children of admin staff, you know, sending notes and love and appreciation. And we just tried to make it a really fun evening of connection. It really became really just this evening of love and connection with Steppenwolf. And we have this incredible ensemble of actors who are not working right now. And, um, extremely generous with their time and their creativity and so they dove right in um, arm in arm with us to just make it as fun as fun as possible it's interesting because you raise the fear that all of us have in okay we can do this virtually and we can get the we know how we know how to do this we're we're theater people uh, but how how is the the mechanism for raising money gonna work um, because, you know, at galas, we sell tickets and tables, um, sponsorships. So now, um, the opportunity is really to do something more public and you've reached all these people. Um, but then it is like, how do we, um, you know, how do we replace tickets and tables and, and how can we sustain ourselves, you know, over the long haul? So we can loop back to that in terms of strategies, but um, Caitlin, I'm curious how you see um, what you're seeing from your perspective and um, in terms of the pandemic. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I've been thinking about that question and I, I think for me anyway, I still don't know the answer to it. Yeah. I feel mm -hmm. like it's been all over the gamut. I, 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 it's been, you know, when this first, when this whole thing happened, um, I think you know, my team and I just felt like, oh my God, what are we going to do? And there was like, there was probably about a week of paralysis where we didn't, certainly didn't want to ask anybody for money right then and there because right. it just felt incredibly tone deaf. Yeah. Um, but then as, you know, as we got to the second week, it was like, you know, I mean, if I don't ask people for money every day, I start to twitch. So <laughs> we got to start doing something here because I feel like, you know, I'm being paid to do nothing. Um, so, and I think, you know, what we, what we discovered, I think in those first, very first few weeks is that, um, people wanted to be helpful. Um, they were afraid naturally, um, people were watching, you know, you know, money run out of their 401ks and their portfolios, like water through a sieve. Um, and, and I, we gave people the opportunity, thought, well, you know, what if we employ the Bernie Sanders model and just let lots of people give lots of little gifts? And that's really what we did. And, and um, we did an, um, our first um, appeal for what we were calling our rebound campaign went out on a Saturday. And I normally I'd be like, oh my God, don't send something on a Saturday, it's gonna die. Like, this world, I don't know, time means nothing anymore, right? So we sent it on a Saturday and it was our most successful one day um, email campaign ever. So uh, it, it, clearly people were, were out there um, and receptive. And I, I've just, as I said, it really has run the gamut. I mean, I, 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 you know, in asking for money, I have seen everything from the no, no way whatsoever to, you know, incredibly generous gifts of profound generosity. Yeah. Um, I think it's just been, I, and I, I, I don't, you know, I feel like we're in, we're in the, the maelstrom right now. So it's just hard to know. And I think, you know, six months from now or a year from now, when we look back, maybe we'll see patterns. I don't really see a pattern right now. Daria, you wanted to respond. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, the, 
the real challenge that we're going to be facing as we go forward from this moment is encouraging people to make an investment that may not pay dividends for some time. Um, you know, we're, we're doing our best to keep connected with our community. We're offering different, uh, our school of theater is offering programming. Um, we have, a, a play, we're, do, we're participating in play at home. We're participating, we've created an online play reading group and things like that. And we have some other ideas. Um, and we will be announcing our season shortly, which we hope will begin uh, in January but nobody really knows. And we're going to be inviting people to subscribe. We're going to be inviting people to give. Um, and they may be investing in the future of Berkeley Rep and not necessarily something that they'll be able to see and touch anytime soon. That's interesting because, um, you know, when I was talking with some colleagues the other day, I said, I'm less worried about FY20 than I'm worried about 21 and 22. How do you, do you feel the same way? Yeah. Wow. I, because the, the philanthropy, you know, there's been an initial, you know, boost. And I think part of our challenge is going to keep it, as you say, keep the message out there and current. But Greg, you've got this national perspective. You're seeing little theater companies, big theater companies, medium companies. Like, what, what are you seeing and what, what do you, you know, what do you think in terms of the pandemic and, and its effect on fundraising? Well, you know, the big thing I, that I'm seeing that I think projecting forward is going to be really important is, you know, we've been so mired in this mindset in the past of, um, you know, scarcity and competing with each other for the, what, the scraps of the philanthropic table. Yes. And I don't think that's going to work anymore. I don't think we can be fighting with each other for what's left. It's got to be about collective action. It's got to be saying we're here as a, as a community, as a, Field nationally and locally, but you can see this, you know, the success, we do have $75 million to give out, which yes. of course we wish it was more, but that's happening right now. Um, but in terms of individual donors who are really your bread and butter and, and philanthropy, like uh, foundations, to give that message that now is not the time to sit on your endowments. Now is not the time to spend 5%, but actually spend, you know, don't spend the legally minimum, minimum that you can spend, but actually you won't have anyone left to give money to unless you give everything you can right now. And also thinking back to the example of 2008, have the conversation, look, you all got scared of whether your individuals or your foundations of your investments. Guess what? They all bounced back. They're going to, I think I can say this, I'll, I'll say this in some problems, they're going to bounce back again. So maybe you don't have a billion dollars now, maybe you have 800 million. You're going to go back to have a, just spend it because now is the time to invest, but we've got to all say that as a field with one voice together. Oh, right, and of course we all are worried about the most vulnerable people in our community, which is our artists that make the magic. And um, you know, this scarcity mentality is something that I, I lecture about in my cultural policy class because I think it's directly related to what we were talking about earlier about us stating our value case. We were like. Well, there's a there's a scarcity. We'll 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 fight over the crumbs. No, let's like get a bigger pie because you know we um you know we contribute to this society more than ever. And I, and I've been thinking, you know, you got to keep the theater alive because once we can gather again, the theater is going to be key to the economy. This is like we know we know why we go to the theater for the soul service that it gives us. But like, let's just talk business right now. And theater means business and. If you let the theaters die when the when the economy comes back, we're you know that's not going to be a good thing. You want people because that that's they're going to go to restaurants, they're going to park, they're going to depending on where in the country you know it is. So I think it's really important that we get make sure we get our advocacy messages um, right around that. Um, let's talk. Let's go back to specifically galas because I know a lot of people are interested in this. Um, so. Tell us how the um, other galas you've seen that have worked digitally, um, are there strategies that you've um, admired of other companies around the country? Is there anything we can share with this audience in terms of things you've seen that you think work? I can, I can tell you about Berkeley Reps Gala. Um, it, so our, our gala was scheduled uh, for April 18th. And uh, 
by the end of February, we were starting to get concerned about whether or not we were actually going to be able to do an in-person event. And uh, we, we pivoted at the beginning of March to an online event. We quickly learned about the different platforms that were available and uh, got the buy-in from our board and our fundraising committees and uh, set up a, an online uh, fundraising website. And um, we, we didn't go the direction that Leslie spoke of, of um, just making it free for everyone, but we um, normally, this is, you know, this is our one fundraising event of the year. Um, tickets are usually $750 up to $25,000 for a table of 10. Um, we have a, a live auction where the, the auction items are fair market value minimum $10,000. So it's a very high end event. But we decided that in this period, um, we were going to say that any donation to Berkeley Rep made in this fundraising period you would be invited to our uh, an event, uh, a live stream event on April 18th, featuring our honoree, Anna Devere Smith. Yay. And um, we went back to, by, by the time that we pivoted to the online event, we had already um, raised close to $400,000 in ticket and table sales. And so we went back to uh, the folks who had purchased those tickets and tables who were mostly board members and people who were very close to the organization um, and asked them to turn that into a completely tax deductible donation and uh, become a fundraising team. So their donation would be a portion of their fundraising goal. And then they would go out and fundraise the rest of it from their, their network, from their friends. And of course, we also had a, you know, a fundraising effort that went out to Berkeley rep lists and email campaign and so forth. We created fundraising teams for um, each of our production departments because we wanted people to really understand what and who they were contributing to. And one thing that we didn't anticipate was that uh, our production teams became very com competitive with each other and they fundraised quite a bit. Um, we had our, our stage management group, I think, raised uh, close to $10,000. Um, but we also had you know, past employees, current employees, um, past fellows, people who were on the verge of being laid off or who may even have just been laid off, who were making contributions. Um, and it was, it was really an amazing moment for the theater. And then we all got to celebrate on April 18th with this, this beautiful event. And we, we didn't change our fundraising goal. Um, the, the goal of the original event was $900,000. And um, between all of these efforts, we ended up exceeding our goal and raising um, over $950,000. Wow, that, thank you so much for sharing that and all the details of that and because it's so generous for you to share that and I, I'm sure inspires a lot of people around the country. Um, and um, so Caitlin, talk about what you guys are doing from an event standpoint. Yeah, sure. First of all, I just really want to congratulate Leslie and Daria on their events. They were both amazing. Oh. And, and Daria, um, Lynn Eve was just such a rock star to me, um, you know, because we're, you know, we're your neighbors across the bay and, you know, we, she and I had lots of phone conversations like, oh my God, what do we do now? Because we had a fundraising event. Um, so we normally do um, three fundraising events because I, I do, I love events. Uh, we have our main gala, which is in the fall. Then we, we had, we had a, a smaller fundraising event around Christmas Carol in December. And then in the spring, we were doing an event called our Spring Fling, which was um, just to raise money for our education programs. And, and um, it's a $350,000 goal, which, you know, at the time, you know, six, seven, eight months ago felt, you know, modest. Uh, little did we know. So we, again, this was going to be an in-person event. We normally have about 225 people who participate. And um, yeah, we had to make the call. Uh, you know, our, the, 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 the folks who were co-chairing, uh, leading the event, were sort of like, well, that's it. That's that. You know, it's like, well, no, 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 no. You don't get out of that that easy. I said, uh, give us some time to work out, to come up what we can come up with to try to create a virtual fundraising gala. And we went back and our amazing artistic team uh, came back with fabulous ideas. They came, um, 
with the idea of working with uh, Anthony Veneziali, uh, the co-creator of Freestyle Love Supreme, as a live host. Um, the cast from our two canceled shows of Poor Yellow Rednecks and Rocky Horror very graciously all created music videos right in their, in their homes. And we had an amazing marketing team, an amazing uh, videographer who did great editing work, built this all together. And um, like Berkeley Rep, we, we signed on with, um, with a, a fundraising platform to help us do the online, online fundraising and the text to give. It was our absolute first time experience with this. We had some folks um, who signed on to do the little mini fundraising teams, no, nothing near the, the level that, um, that you guys had, certainly at, at Berkeley Rep. Um, and uh, people, we, we uh, didn't charge any money for it. Um, if you gave $100 or more, you got invited to a pre-event um, virtual VIP cocktail party uh, with B.D. Wong. So Pam McKinnon, our artistic director in conversation with B.D. Wong, he's such a recognizable face. Um, and we had some board members who came in almost in the 11th hour and, and did some matching gifts, uh, pledges, which really helped us. And we had raised about 50% of the money um, before COVID-19 happened. And every person except for one, one person who had bought a single ticket very graciously allowed us to keep the money and convert it to a, a donation. And we, of course, you know, invited them to the, the cocktail recept, the, the VIP cocktail party. And the other thing that we did, um, which felt really good to us is um, in, 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 in terms of just wanting to express solidarity with the, um, the artistic community in the area. So there's an organization called Theater Bay Area that our associate artistic director is on the board of, and they had just launched a performing arts workers relief fund. Working artists who are now, you know, experiencing financial displacement through through this 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 terrible pandemic. So we arranged that they would get a portion of the proceeds for that evening, and we felt we felt like we had a responsibility to do that as the. Um, the, the, the largest employer of artists and theater makers in San Francisco, it just, it felt like the right thing to do. And I think that also, um, I think that resonated well with, with the community. And, and um, again, we had people from all across the country who joined us for that evening. Um, 65 members of our staff, again, you know, a staff that was facing layoffs, um, contributed, and we exceeded our goal by, we, we got That's amazing seven out of the, the 350. I know you could have knocked me over with a feather. I, but see that, that goes back to what Greg was talking about is that we're all in this together and that kind of collective action as a development strategy, if you told a development person like 15 years ago, like give away some of your money, they'd be like, are you crazy? Um, you know, we did a similar thing with our Obi Award, which was that, you know, we weren't going to do um, an in-person uh, ceremony for obvious reasons. And we decided to take a portion of the what we would have spent on the production and, and um, give out, it out as relief grants to artists who had their um, productions canceled. And two donors stepped up right away and allowed us to give $500 to 506 artists who were affected and, you know, um, the thing was, we know that we can't solve that problem, you know, totally, but, and we're a nonprofit ourselves, but the idea of everyone finding a way to do their part, I think is what's going to get us out of it. And I think we'll raise more money as a result. Um, speaking of that, we have some questions and um, there's a young artist that is asking the question, uh, as an artist, what can I do um, to do my part to get people to understand that the arts are essential to help your fundraising efforts, um, despite not being able to gather together? Um, you know, a lot of people are talking about what they might do. So as, you know, artists, um, do, do you guys have advice for young artists who have platforms um, of how they can help? I mean, one thought is you can, um, you can use your platform to promote what your local theater organizations and artists are doing to promote you know any advocacy efforts that include like the stimulus to include the gig workers and you know to you know check in with uh, Americans for the Arts to figure out what your advocacy messages you know can be to help support the organization any any other thoughts on that question and, and I just think just just keep creating just keep getting yeah. you know 
getting your work out there in whatever way, shape, or form, because I, I, I think the world is in some way realizing how important um, the arts are. I mean, look at this, this whole shelter in place. What have people been doing to keep sane? They've been turning to the arts. They're watching, you know, Netflix and, and you know, streaming online content like it's going out of style. And I, I really think at the end of the day, uh, the, you know, we will see as a community how much, you know, we valued this and took it for granted. I think it's also important, I, Caitlin, tagging off what you just said, um, that people understand that um, what they see on Netflix actually has an arts background. Yes. Um, that, that that's where it comes from. That 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 the writers and the creators uh, these days are going back and forth quite a bit. Um, but a lot of the folks that you see, you know, on your favorite Netflix show, um, got their training in the theater. Yeah. Um... I, I think it's, um, uh, Melissa, you want to get in? Yeah, no, I just, you know, pre preparing for this panel, uh, something that the team discussed was just, I think, the importance of delivering the message that there's quite a bit of creativity that goes into fundraising. And if anything, <laughs> if anything is, as a result of this conversation, you know, I really hope that perhaps our K through 12 students or students who are in college or university are taking this away from this conversation is that that, that creativity is fundamental in the pivoting um, that you're doing um, uh, working in fundraising. And um, I just think that, you know, gearing or redirecting it toward the question uh, from the artists, uh, creativity feeds creativity. Right, like how can we stay creative? And it, when we're watching art, whether it's if you're posting on social media, like that's a small way to contribute that I think um, definitely pays off because right now creativity is what we need to keep going to rethink how we're doing things. Um, and so I again encourage people in the chat if you're taking away anything because I know I am. I'm furiously writing notes down. Please share it um, because I think that if anything, that is something I wish. Um, for people to take away is that there's quite a there bit are so many um yeah i mean and that's the that's the argument melissa for arts education too which is that it's not just to create artists and it's like creativity is desperately needed in this society if we're going to get ourselves out of this hole that we're in we need creative solutions and and the arts teach those solutions there's so many questions coming in so i'm going to try to get to them and i'm going to say to all the people that are with us, um, we are with you. We will keep this conversation going. We are in this together and we are gonna solve this together. So we're gonna get to a few more questions. There, this is a tough one and, uh, and something I think we all think about, which is, you know, there's a question about how um, all the stuff we're doing online, are we going to, you know, devalue the live experience? And, um, you know, and the thing is, as much as we are doing this, um, online, you know, and as much as I would be scared the first time somebody maybe coughed on me, no. And I, I, there's nothing like being in the theater and going on that journey where anything can happen, literally. And so I choose to say, no, I think once it's safe, people are going to want to get back and they're going to want to interact with people. But, but what do you feel, Daria? Do you, um, I'm sorry, Daria. <laughs> sorry. Um, well, I absolutely agree that there there is nothing like like the live experience, um, and I don't know. I for myself, I I miss it very much, and that's what we're hearing from from all of our our patrons and our donors how much they miss it. And it has been amazing how much um, they still want to connect with us in whatever way they can. And I think as soon as people feel safe in in coming back to a live in person experience, they will. Yeah, I think, you know, you can sit around and watch the Food Network all day or the Great British Baking Show, but you still are going to want to eat actual food at some point. So, you know, and I think, I think the answer is also that it doesn't devalue. We are making do in this time, and I think the fact that these things are as good as they are speaks to the level of talent and creativity we have in our industry. But it, it, I, it's, it's not going to take away from the live experience. I mean, this is a very difficult moment because this is something where we don't know where the end is. 
And, you know, it's going to require science and medicine to intervene to make people feel comfortable. And then it's going to take time. But I do think, um, you know, that the live experience, you know, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't get up every day if I didn't think that, that we we're coming back to that. Um, it's just a matter of time. And, and I think that that's the desire, um, you know, to get back to that. Somebody, um, when we were talking about galas, one of the things we're doing, I'll just share um, in terms of the tables, we're gonna try, is that I've been very inspired by the um, PEN America dinners. I don't know if everybody knows this organization, PEN America in New York City, that supports writers every year at a certain time of year, they have donors host dinners in their apartments like artist salons with a writer. So people come in, they have dinner, they introduce the writer and they have a Q and A with the writer and the, the donor either pays for whatever, like it would be the equivalent of a table in order to host that, or they seek the donations from um, you know, their individual guests. And so what we're gonna try is do that through Zoom um, and basically have people sign up to say, you know, you're gonna have a, you know, an online happy hour with whatever artist and um, you know, see if people will pay so the sort of the equivalent of the table. And that will lead up to a, a virtual um, gala event that we'll do. So we're gonna experiment with that and see how that works. Um, in some ways, it's less intimate, obviously, because we're distanced, but in a way, at our gala, uh, everybody doesn't have a, a major theater artist sitting at their table, so, and be able to ask questions, and, you know, and we've had a lot of great creative ideas, like people said, well, somebody should design a specialty cocktail for it and send out the recipe beforehand, just ways to create interaction, so um, I think we're all going to learn a lot. Um, through this um, you know, process and we'll see what works and, and, and what doesn't work. Um, we're wrapping up and you know, we have about 10 minutes left and um, I just wanna um, you know, say we've been talking about artists and um, I'm very privileged to have uh, the amazing writer David Henry Wong as my board chair. And I wanna go back to something that you said, Greg. Um, you know, when we were talking about you know, do we, what, how conservative is our approach? Right now, do we just husband all the, our cash and duck and wait, or do we, or do we move forward prudently, carefully but prudently but confidently? And David said, as we can't imagine, as it won't be a surprise, one of the most inspiring things that I think um, really needs to get out there, which is that um, he started his remarks with the board, is that essentially we all need to now think of ourselves like an artist, behave like an artist, because the artists that have been lucky enough to sustain themselves this long in the industry know how to take risks and avoid the silly ones if they're lucky, and, but the taking of risks. And so you follow the vision until the vision doesn't work anymore. And um, I just thought those were the most beautiful words and I probably didn't say them perfectly but the spirit of that um, and I think that's what we're all saying is we're gonna follow the vision we have to do it differently and we need each other you know so much during this to learn from each other but we're gonna follow the vision until the vision no longer works um, and um, you know it's to me it is always about following the artists because that's why we're all here yeah so remember that saying money follows vision so yes yeah. amen to that so i'd love to go around and have people say um final words of hope and inspiration or anything they want to say and we'll start with you greg all right actually it's funny i had actually written down on my notes of things to say something almost not not in david henry wong's wonderful words but in this <laughs> in my own version of that, the same words, that this is not the time for retrenchment. This is not the time to be timid. When I look at, even just from our perspective of panel review and grant proposals, but also in the larger perspective of what is gonna get people back off their couches and into a theater again, where somebody might die. I only wish I had someone behind me unwrapping candy at this point. Um, yes. But Seriously. popping near, you know, what's gonna get people right. off their couches, and it's, gonna, it's, it's not gonna be business as usual. It's gonna be, what are we providing that is of more than just entertainment value? Because I can get the entertainment now from Netflix. How are we serving the community? Are my, how are my neighbors invested in this, in this, in this organization? 
Um, and how is it accessible to, you know, everybody in my community? And frankly, as I look at the faces, the uncomfortable part of the conversation around, that are on our grid, does it look like my community? Mm -hmm. Caitlin. You're, you're asking the Irish person for, for, for uh, words of hope. <laughs> <laughs> I have a little of that. Perspective. Perspective. No. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, just to say, listen, we, we, we are going to get through this. You know, I, I, I believe that we're going to get through this. And, um, you know, I think you're, you're, the point made earlier about us um, sharing resources, being there for one another, I think that's going to be more and more important because um, we're not going to get, no, no one orga theater organization is going to get through this alone, right? You know, we need one another. We need to be able to, to bounce ideas off of one another. And we need the support, even just the reach out to say, you know, to understand that you're not alone and what you're experiencing, your team and your organization is experiencing is what others are experiencing. And I think that, you know, we've been doing so much stewardship has been really the name of the game for us the last two months, just calling people a lot of our major donors, board members, especially the people who are on their own, um, just checking in with people. And, and you know, our, this community that supports us, I believe they want us to survive. They want us to be successful. Um, they want us to be here for them when this is with us all over and we come out on the other side of it. And, um, and, and that gives me great hope. Great, Leslie. Well, one thing I, I was totally going to get on the stewardship um, bandwagon, because that's the one thing that um, in 2008, the organizations that really weathered the storm um, better um, than others were those who really, like Caitlin was saying, are in touch with their people and they're having conversations because people really do want to help. Um, and we're just finding that the more we reach out, um, just it, it's just a very happy thing um and i, I do think people really do want to help um so just staying connected staying connected is so so important and um daria your finally final words of wisdom i'm, I'm gonna say something very similar i think it, it really gets back to the basics of fundraising which is just person to person and and passion to passion um kind of back to what you were saying at the beginning heather that you know people are often very scared about having conversations about money and donating money and that kind of thing but if you're if you've done your homework and you're talking to the right person about something that they care about they'll want to give it's it's totally true it's passion and follow through and 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 some research like you don't want to be talking to a retailer right now um <laughs> you know right. about a, a sponsorship probably but um this uh, panel has been fantastic. You have been such incredibly generous panelists. Um, and, um, you know, this is what gives me hope because having spent uh, too many years in this uh, business, uh, wait, but that's why when they start calling you seasoned, you know, you pass a certain, you know, <laughs> you pass a certain point. But, you know, that, that I know the, the quality of the people that, that do this work. Um, and you have demonstrated that tonight. And we're so fortunate to have a champion like Greg um, in the NEA, um, you know, fighting for us, um, you know, and keeping alive the, the vision for, you know, government support of the arts that it is, um, it is an absolute, they get an, an amazing return on the investment in so many ways, even if we just talk financially, but we know that we can talk in all these other ways. And so, you know, um, there's such great, great um, people in this industry. And I, you know, tonight has just uh, fortified my belief that we are going to help each other and get through this and protect our precious theater community, not because it's just our, our club, because we know that it's essential to American life and to our, our past, our present, and our future. And we are the, the people that will carry that torch. Um, so let's end by saying thank you to development people everywhere for all that you do. Thank you for everyone. <laughs> yes. Um, you, uh, we're sending love to you. We're sending support to you. People whose questions we didn't get to 
please, you know, stay with us. I think we will do another one of these because there's so much to talk about. Um, and everybody um, stay well and stay connected. Thank you so much.